I love services like this because I can take my time in the message. I don't have to, I'm not rushed by people having to scurry away for Bible class, which is not a bad thing, but I can take my time. I want to do my best job tonight, and I spent some time with this, in putting this Ascension Day worship, this message, into its proper place tonight. And this is going to be in view of correct theology and what we do in the Lutheran church. The heritage in that we have become so, so accustomed to hearing and seeing in our Lutheran church. Why we're here tonight. With heritage, I start with this. For four days in October... 1529. Anybody know what happened October 1529? No, the, did somebody say the Reformation? No, no, no. Well, we were, yes, we were Reformed, but no, that was 1517. But 1529, the Reformers, Dr. Martin Luther and Dr. Ulrich Zwingli, what a name, Zwingli, met at Castle Marburg for a dispute. It's called the Marburg Disputation. In order to bring theological unity to a young, desperate Protestant church. Zwingli was the leader in the Reformation in Sweden. Zwingli also eventually, before 1529, after 1517, abandoned the sacramental nature of the church. He was more humanistic. But anyway, Luther and Zwingli agreed on almost everything except for what we call real presence. Real presence of Christ's body and blood in the sacrament of the altar. Zwingli was convinced that he needed to employ human reason. And he insisted that the Lord's Supper was only symbolic. It was a symbolic remembrance. Luther held fast to sola scriptura. Scripture alone. God's word alone. And he maintained that Christ gives his body and blood for us Christians to eat and drink. The benefit the forgiveness of sins. At the heart of this dispute, which we still dispute this today, it remains today, the Reformed and the Lutherans. The Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church. At the heart of the dispute is the understanding of who Christ is and what Christ does. And how he still does it today. That's the dispute. And actually what the ascension is all about. And actually what heaven means. And what we do, what Christ does for us. Okay, that's a little bit of the history of the church. Now I'm going to take you back to the Bible. 2,000 years ago. 2,000 plus years ago. For 40 days after the resurrection... Today, it's been 40 days since we celebrated Easter back in April. So 40 days after the resurrection, the risen Lord Jesus met with his disciples in order to bring understanding and unity in an inexperienced group of people. Post-Easter, we preached about peace. He said, peace be with you. We read about that. Post-Easter, we read how he displayed his pierced hands, his feet, his side. They could touch him, and they could see that Jesus was really present and not a spirit. We even mentioned and read that he ate a piece of broiled fish and said, Hey, guys, it's me. And then Jesus teaches them, and he shows them everything in Scripture. With Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. It was written of him in the fulfillment of his death and his resurrection. 
Jesus says in Luke 24, 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. And so, what does he do? He calms his fear, he eats with them, and he teaches them. He is with them in a new way. Okay, they got to pay attention. He's with them in a new way. Before he was crucified and rose from the dead, Jesus walked among him in what we call his humiliation. There are two states, Jesus' humiliation and Jesus' exaltation. His humiliation takes him from his conception to his burial. His exaltation takes him from when he descended into hell to where now he sits on the right hand of the Father and will come back again to judge both the living and the dead. Two states. Jesus walked among them in humility. His divine nature was hidden. Now Jesus is exalted, having been raised by the Father. Matter of fact, no longer does Jesus call himself the Son of Man, but now Jesus calls himself Christ. And as the exalted Christ, his visible presence becomes an extraordinary presence. Even after his ascension, it's an extraordinary thing. But now Jesus must ascend to the Father. We're told in Luke 24, 15 and 51. Then he led the disciples out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. There's a question. Does that make him far away? If you go back to Acts, the first chapter, our reading. It says that the disciples stood there and gazed up into heaven. They gazed. They were wondering, where did Jesus go? It kind of reminds me, we used to give kids on Easter Sunday after the sunrise service. We would give them helium balloons back before we couldn't anymore. The city told us to stop it because cows apparently were eating the balloons. But that's a whole other story. And the kids would let the balloons go. And those kids, just a few would stand out there to the bitter end until they couldn't see the balloon. And they were gazing up into the sky. Question, are the disciples left alone? At least until Jesus comes back at the end of the world? Question, aren't we being left alone now that Jesus has become what some say is a distant God far away from us in heaven? I mean, aren't there plenty of times in our life, in our everyday walk of life, that we wish we could see Jesus visibly? Don't you wish that? Don't we all act that way? Do we ever say, I wish Jesus was here? Do we ever say or think at times, well, if God wasn't so far away, this would have never happened to me? All right, put that back in your brain a little bit. Let's go back to Lutheran's wingling. The reformer Zwingli saw the ascension as Christ escaped from the earth to be seated at the Father's right hand. God's right hand, Jesus being placed at the edge of the created universe. That's what Zwingli saw. For Zwingli, Jesus went far away and he'll come back only on the last day. On the other hand, Luther trusted completely in the Christ's words. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus established himself. Jesus redeemed us. You see, during the course of this Marburg debate, Luther came to realize that Zwingli was of a different spirit that's a small s than the Holy Spirit. Zwingli rejected the working of God's spirit and leaned only on his own understanding. Luther, on the other uh, other hand, understood scripture alone and listened to the word of God. You've come here tonight to listen to the true word of God with your minds and your hearts opened by God's spirit to hear and to understand scripture. And you see tonight that Jesus does not abandon us in his ascension. Rather, Jesus continues to be truly with us and to present himself to us in a brand new means. Christ is truly present in his gifts. 
What are his gifts? The word and the sacrament. The means of grace. By his ascension, we see the mighty King Jesus ruling over his church. By his ascension, we see Jesus on the right hand of the Father in authority. Ephesians 1, 21 to 22. Jesus is put out and says this, far above all authority and power and dominion, he is head over all things to the church. In his ascension, the crucified and risen one has risen even higher. That's the great thing about this. He's risen even higher. And he's reigning his death and his resurrection, distributing his sacrificial gifts to you, his people, as the mighty king, the one with authority. These gifts that we receive are not symbols. They are not simple remembrances of what he has accomplished on our behalf. They are the means by which the ascended Christ gives himself, gives his word, and gives his work to us because he rules the church in authority. These means rest upon Christ's name, rest upon his cross, rest upon his resurrection. These are the gifts that he gives us in his authority and power to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. That's why the ascension is so important. It shows us Jesus and his rules and as he continues to govern his church. You've got repentance. You've got forgiveness. It is accomplished and it is maintained by an ascension of Jesus Christ who rules. How does Jesus rule? How does he continue to rule today? Number one, he rules through his gospel preaching and teaching that the Christ must suffer and then rise from the dead. What does the gospel do? It creates faith and strengthens you, the believer. We are then joined in his crucifixion and his resurrection in the waters of holy baptism. It is baptism that he makes us his holy people. The cross is then placed on us in holy absolution, which we did just a few moments ago, where repentant hearts in contrition receive, continue to receive the forgiveness of sins. Christ then leads us, and only after that, he leads us to his very body and blood given to us as Christians to eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins in the sacrament of the altar. That's the ascended Christ. And while Christ parted from his disciples' sight, being carried up into heaven, he raised his hands in blessings, and he continues to bless us in our witness and bless us in our worship. Colossians 3, 1 to 4 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Tonight again, Christ opens your minds to understand he opens your hearts to believe. He is truly present with us today. He rules his church as he sits at the right hand of the Father. With that in mind, we boldly continue to worship. And we know that the gates of heaven are open. And he's ready to receive us one day. That should give you great joy. To God be all the glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus unto everlasting life. Amen. We continue with our offering.